We're going to continue our series, Answers, and it's answering the tough questions that we've all asked, right? The point of this series is for people to basically understand why we believe what we believe, why we believe in Christ, why we believe in God, um, and, and the things of that sort, while also answering tough questions. And today we're going to be talking about is uh, why does God allow evil and suffering? How can, God, how can a good, holy, loving God allow evil in this world or coexist with evil, right? And these are some of the big questions. These are, these are some of life's biggest questions that I think some of us may not understand. And so uh, we're going to be a little philosophical today. We're going to be a little uh, theoretical, right? Talk about things of that sort. But we all listen to podcasts. We all read books. We listen to podcasts that are like four hours long and are totally fine. So I think we'll be A-OK today. And so we're going to start by reading from Scripture. It's 1 Peter 3.15. So I encourage you, if you have a Bible or the Bible app, this is our verse for this series, and it's very important. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Would you guys pray with me for a moment? God, thank you for just these moments that we have. Thank you for the breath in our lungs. Thank you that we've woken up and made it here today safely, God. I pray that we would be aware of your spirit, that we'd be aware of your moving, because you always are doing something. You're moving. You're shaking things up, God, but sometimes we let our hard heads get in the way. So I pray that we would actually be aware of what you are doing this morning, God. And I pray that my words would be solely yours and not my own, because my word returns void, God, but yours never does. So I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. So this one is a tough one. I think it's probably the toughest one uh, of them all in in response to why we believe in the Christian God. Because here's the thing. I had a cousin about two months or so ago. He passed away, and he's 18 years old. He passed away, and he had just graduated, had his whole life ahead of him, and it was in a car accident, right? And it's in these moments that you you kind of ask, why, God? Why did this happen? I'm not... Uh, void of that question, right? I, I'm a devout Christian, but I'm not somebody who's better than asking that question, if that makes sense. And so when that happened, it's like I grew up with him. I watched him grow up. He was always bigger than all my other little cousins. I was I'm uh, about, yeah, 10 years older than him. Uh, and he always would be just be roughing up my cousins, and it was hilarious because he was so much bigger than the rest of my tiny cousins. He was just a big boy, all right? And it's in these moments because he passed away because they're, they're on the road. He wasn't driving, but somebody cut them off, swerved into them to which they had to maneuver their car, lost control, and that's how it happened. And so in these moments, I ask, why, God? Why him? Why so young? Why did this have to happen? Especially somebody swerved into him, right? There's anger. There's all these emotions. There's things happening. We've all dealt with evil. We've all, all dealt with loss. We've all dealt with the why, God. Why is this happening, right? And this leads to the question. This leads to, this is where this question comes from. Is like, how can I believe in a holy, loving, all-powerful God when things like this happen? How can I believe in this God, right? And on the larger scale... When we think about it, when we think about God and people have these questions, it's like, why should I believe in a God when there's rape, there's murder, there's addiction, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's uh, robbery, theft, there's all of these things, slanderous people. Why do I want to believe in a God who allows all of this? Those are honest questions. And those are things that we're going to talk about because it's like, God, why didn't you do something about this? Why didn't you do something about that? It's an age-old question. So when we read 1 Peter 3.15, we need to start in this idea of answering questions, of having proper answers for these by honoring Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts. It starts there. I don't care if we become intellectual giants. I don't care if we become geniuses. If we're not honoring Christ the Lord as holy within our hearts, it's for naught, okay? And so we need to always be prepared to make a defense. The word apologia, it's where we get that Greek word, it's where we get the word apologetics, right? Uh, it says, make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. And here's the thing, here's what, the important thing. It says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I don't care to slap people in the face with truth. I don't care to be rude to people with truth. I care to answer their questions, to be kind with them. 
and be uh, sympathize with them and try to meet them on their level and show them why I believe in this Christian God and why I believe him to be the only way, the only way. So as we continue on where this kind of philosophical stance comes from is a statement by David Hume. He's where we get like skepticism and naturalism, these worldviews. He was a Scottish philosopher. And here's, here's what he presents. And here's where we see all of this now. People who believe in certain things, like I can't believe in God if there's evil. It really comes from this guy in the 1700s. And it says, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's impotent. He's not all powerful. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malevolent. He's not a good God. Is he both able and willing? Why then is there evil? And at the forefront, it seems like it makes sense. It seems like, huh, that's interesting. Take somebody back and maybe I could kind of get that, right? But as we unpack that, we're going to see it doesn't really make sense. And the hard part with this question, with these questions, is that it's more than theoretical and philosophical and logical, right? It's emotional, because people feel this question. People feel this problem. I feel this problem. Why is there evil? I, I feel that. I feel, why is there suffering? And so as we unpack that, you can leave that statement uh, actually on the screen. I, I just want that to be up there. But when we look at this statement, we'll find out that it doesn't actually prove anything. It just makes a statement. And what I mean by that is that the assumption is that a good and loving and all-powerful God cannot exist in the face of evil. And it makes that statement. However, it doesn't tell us why. It just makes the statement. So from the beginning, we see, okay, this doesn't really prove anything. It's kind of just a statement. As we unpack this, we see, why can God, I would like to ask, why do we believe, or why would somebody believe that God a holy, good, and loving God cannot exist in the face of evil. Not coexisting, not as a team together, like God is, wants evil for people. God wants us uh, to endure uh, evil all the time, 24-7. That's not what I'm saying, but why, can evil, uh, why can't evil exist and also a good, holy, and loving God? Because we believe that God exists, moves, and works in spite of evil, in spite of suffering, in spite of pain, right? Is, is a higher authority of it. And so we'll see why I say this, and we'll see why I kind of make that assumption, and I'm going to show you why, because here are some issues with this statement. Here are some issues with what David Hume has to say, and we'll go on to the next slide, and it says this. Here's, here's my reasoning, and here's what I think is true. Here's an issue with the idea of eliminating evil, is that our all-powerful, good, and loving God cannot eliminate evil without eliminating us first, or imposing on our free will, okay? And what I mean by that, you got to think, if God was going to obliterate evil, take evil off the face of the planet, anything evil, any suffering, any pain, then he has to take out the people who caused it, okay? And then where do we go from there? Like, we've all lied, we've all cheated, we've all stolen, we've all slandered people. We probably all just gossiped somebody yesterday, we talk trash on people consistently, so is that... God needs to take that off the face of the earth, right? That's evil. That's not a, we would say that that's not inherently a good thing. So when we look at it and we look at this, this issue, there's, there, there's big issues here because if God were going to eliminate evil, it'd be me. <laughs> it'd be you. It'd be everybody on this earth. So when people make that, that assumption, they're basically asking God to wipe them out. They're basically saying, God, take me out. Nobody wants that. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want that, Okay. I like living, I like my life. And, the, and like I said, if, if God decided at 12 midnight he's going to take off all the evil in the world, he's going to just get rid of it, would we be here at 1201? Would any of us? And that's the thing that we kind of have to ask. That's the thing that we kind of have to reconcile in this life. Because if we truly want God to get rid of evil, then no humans would exist. No creation would exist. And a good and loving God allows evil to exist in the world because here's the thing, he loves his creation. He loves his creation. It's not necessarily because uh, God is evil if he lets evil come about and whatnot, but it's because he loves us. It's because he's patient with us. It's because he always gives us a moment, a creator who loves his creation always gives them chances to turn away from their wickedness, right? To turn away from their evil, to turn away from the wrongdoing and say, you know what, I'm going to choose the thing that is better, 
I'm going to choose the thing that is much better than the evil that I'm choosing now. Because we know in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Look, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And leave that up on the screen, because in this moment, what Peter is talking about is to people who are being persecuted. And actually, they're, they're kind of asking the question of, God, God, please come back and destroy all of our enemies. Like, bring justice, please. Like, destroy these evil people. Destroy these people who are persecuting us. And what Peter writes is so beautiful here because he's saying, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. Some of us can look out into the world. Some of us can look out and see all the injustices and ask, God, why are you so slow to bring your judgment Why are you so slow to make this better? Why are you so slow to bring justice? When in reality, we should be saying, God, thank you for giving us time. God, thank you for giving us moments to turn to you. God, thank you for being patient. And so Peter is saying he's not slow to fill his promise in the way you think of it. Actually, he's patient towards you. He's patient and kind And loving because, look, God is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It's not that God wants evil, but rather he's just being patient and allowing people to come to him. Because it says in the Bible that God draws people to him, right? He's not going to force us. He draws people to him. That once we're in uh, Jesus' hand, Jesus says that nobody can pluck you from my hand. God draws us in and we come to Christ and we say, you are Lord and Savior and then we're in Christ's hand. Nobody could pluck us out from there. And so as we go on, this this kind of idea is like, okay, that kind of makes sense. That makes sense to me. But why would God even allow evil in the very beginning? Why not start us off? Why not start things without evil? uh, Okay, I kind of hear what you're saying, Dylan, right? But why, why didn't God create it good just to start? Our loving, right, and all-powerful God gave us free will. That's the thing. Knowing in advance the pain and misery and suffering, right, we can cause others and ourselves. And the thing is, God didn't start it just to make us as robots in the very beginning. I don't want to be a robot. I don't think you guys want to be a robot. I think we like the idea of choosing what's best for us, right, I think we like the idea of choosing what I'm going to eat for lunch. I think we like the idea of choosing whether I'm going to focus on this or focus on that. And so God in the very beginning, because he loves us so much, gave us options. Because in a consistent loving relationship, that's what needs to be done. And so God in the very beginning said, you could either follow me and trust what I have to say, or you can disobey me and go after your own will. And that's free will. And that's the beauty of a loving relationship with God is that he gives us a choice. He gives us a chance. He gives us the opportunity to say no thanks. That's loving to me. That's loving to me because look at it. If you think about the act of marriage specifically, if somebody was being married to somebody against their own will, is that love? Is that love? No. That's not love. That's force. That's coercion. That's uh, making somebody do something against their will. And that's not true love within a marriage, right? That's not something healthy. But when we look at marriage in the way where it's two people coming together by their own choice, by their love for one another, by their care for one another, by how much they trust one another because of all the good times and because they love each other, when you see two people coming together in marriage in that way, you can say that is love. That is caring. But here's the thing about marriage, and here's the thing that's so freaking amazing, I'll just say it, is that we do all of these things. We say yes. We say I do. We move forward in this despite all the past arguments, despite all the past pain and misery they may have brought us, right? Because we learn, we grow. In any growing relationship, man, sometimes you just want to say a few choice words to the other person, you know, from time to time. And we do all that in spite of it. We say, I do, in spite of it. And guess what? When you say, I do, what's the risk? There's divorce. There's uh, infidelity. There's lying to one another. There's uh, 
being rude to one another, right? Maybe some of us are just, we find out, man, this person is way different than I thought, right? This is not going how I think it's going to happen. The thing is, we say I do in spite of all the risks, in spite of all the possible future misery, in spite of all the possible future pain, in spite of all the wrong things that could happen, we say yes and I do because of the greater good that is a loving, caring, healthy relationship that's not void of problems, but that is focused on pursuing something better. And so when we look at God and how he loves us and how he cares about us, he didn't make us robots to just do his will, and I, I'm just Dylan, and I just do what God wants, right? He just, he gave us the choice to say yes or no, because that's what happens in a consistent and loving, caring relationship. One that's not of force, but rather of choice. And so in the beginning, God could have made it with no choice, with no love, but he didn't because he chose the greater act of love, of giving us that choice to either choose him or deny him. And what's amazing about marriage, right, because people will try to say, um, why, didn't, why did God choose to make humans this way then if he knew all the pain and suffering and stuff like that, right? I made the marriage example. But here's another thing. Right forward is like people have kids and it's like, well, <laughs> there's some pain right there, you know? And we choose this over and over and over for generations and generations and generations. The logic doesn't really make sense, Right? Because if I say don't have kids because actually it's, it's going to bring a lot of like sleepless nights for you. It's going to bring a lot of frustration, some fighting within the marriage. Um, there's going to be some pain during birth. Better believe that, right? It's going to do all of that. So because there's pain and stuff in the future, don't have kids. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. So with evil, when God, when people say like he should have just made us good to begin with. No, he gave us options because he wanted us to choose the greater good in spite of the future pain, in spite of the future misery, in spite of the future uh, negativity that could come from it. Are you guys tracking with me? And so actually, when we look at evil, we look at suffering, and when we look at those things, I believe, and I'm going to say, that evil, I think, actually lends to the existence of a creator, and God doesn't need evil to exist. He doesn't need anything to exist. But I believe that evil actually points to a higher moral authority. Because here's the thing. We all inherently, you got to think about this. We all inherently and categorically think things like murder, like rape, stealing, um, some people like cancer, um, natural disasters, um, when somebody slanders somebody, lies about somebody. We all categorically say, you know, that's wrong. That's not okay. There's something wrong here, right? Abusing children, all of these, right? And we say that it's wrong. And the thing is, with this idea, is that because we have an idea of right and wrong, because we have an idea of a law kind of written on our hearts, written within our being, we could say and assume that we must have got it from somewhere. That because there is a law that shows us that there is a lawgiver, Okay, because here's the flip side of the coin through Dar Darwinian evolutionary theory, where the idea is there is no purpose, right? We, we kind of came about and through the Big Bang. And I'm not, um, I'm not fighting against how things came to be. I'm not even talking about that right now. But I'm talking about if it is just by chance through Darwinian evolutionary theory that we're here, then our actions and what we do is actually just nature working itself out. Because all we could be in that moment is just matter. We're just physical matter. That's just moving forward, trying to ensure one thing, right? Survival of the fittest. To make sure that I survive. That's all that matters in that moment, in evolutionary theory, is that things that myself explicitly moves forward, and I'm more important than each and every one of you guys, and you guys think you're more important than everybody else in this room. That's what... Darwinian evolutionary theory posits, right? And the thing is, the skeptic or atheist who acknowledges evil in and of itself acknowledges that there's something outside of matter in motion that is kind of pointing us to the direction of, hey, something's wrong. Hey, this isn't right. Something just isn't right with what's going on here, right? Because if we're just evolving, all we would do is try to make ourselves survive and ensure our own survival and make sure that we're living a good, emotionally healthy life, and who cares about anybody else? 
And the thing is, <clears throat> whenever we experience, like I said, anything disjointed or wrong, we feel that pain clawing out of us. We feel something clawing out of us that just says, hey, this, something's wrong here. Something just doesn't make sense. Something is off. And that is completely non-Darwinian. That idea that we feel something wrong off despite laws of nature, that evil acts should just be nature moving themselves forward. Evil in Darwinian theory is just, like I said, evil working out its kinks. It's nature working out its kinks. And at my cousin's funeral, it was this feeling, right? Because if I was just matter in motion, if I was just physical matter, I should just say to my cousin when they're putting him in the ground, they put the, the, the earth over it, I should just say, well, survival of the fittest, man. Sorry. That doesn't make sense. And I should, if I was a part of this creation, you're a part of this so-called Darwinian evolution, that none of us should ever feel like something is wrong, but rather just progression moving us forward, Okay. And I want to give you an example because I probably don't even make perfect sense with that, but I want to give you guys an example that I think makes more sense. Because according, like I said, we'll start here. Evolutionary theory, evil is just nature working out its kinks, okay? We're going to start there. And I want to, uh, how, how do I say this? Um, what I'm going to say is going to be a little bit tough to hear because I'm going to tell a story of something kind of rough that happened in somebody's life years ago, couple, like 25 years ago, whatever it is. But there's this man by the name of Mark Clark. He writes about this prom mom. He writes about her. And so the idea with this prom mom, her name is Melissa Drexler. And so Melissa Drexler goes to her prom in 1997, <clears throat> and she's pregnant, right? And she's on the dance floor, and she feels like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have this kid right here. And she goes to the bathroom. And uh, she has the baby, and she cuts the umbilical cord, and she strangles her baby with the umbilical cord, and then throws it in the garbage, and goes right back onto the dance floor, like nothing ever happened. And I think we could say that's pure evil. There's something really wrong with that. That is not okay, right? And it's tough to hear, and you think about that. It's like, what could bring somebody to do that? That is so evil. And so when I'm talking about when there's no existence of God, here's the reaction to this, right? Here's uh, an, an honest Darwinian evolution theorist. His name's Steven Pinker, right? He wrote this article titled, Why They Kill Their Newborns, right? In response to this happening. Because like I said, if we're just matter in motion, then that shouldn't be anything very difficult to understand, and he kind of downplays the whole thing, and he downplays it, and then he says, look, a capacity for, for neonaticide, killing your babies, killing your young, doing this, is built into the biological design of our parental emotions. He's saying, this is natural. This is just nature working itself out. That's just how it is. That's the, you shouldn't be surprised by this. And he says, if a newborn is sickly, or if its survival is not promising, they may cut their losses in favor of the healthiest litter. You can leave that up there. And so basically what he writes in this, and I'm using that example, is that he's saying, look, if a mother decides to do that, we should not be surprised because she's just only ensuring her own survival. She's matter in motion. She's just following the laws of nature to ensure her own survival over everything else and to, to ensure her emotional well-being. That's just the law. That's just nature. That's human nature. Sorry. There's nothing necessarily evil about that. It's just built into our design. But when people say stuff like that, when people talk in this sense, we understand and recognize that there's something off about this, that that's not okay. And the thing is, if I am part, and you are part, right, of this evolutionary uh, movement forward that we're only focused on our own survival, nobody should feel like this is wrong. Because I'm a part of this nature, right? I'm a part of this nature that you call, but yet there's millions, if not billions, over the course of lifetimes who would say, this is wrong. This is wrong. So as a matter of fact, like I said, the, the, the fact that we can see that there's something wrong and there is something right actually points outside of Darwinian evolution. And that, that light that comes to us or that ideology that comes to us comes from a creator. 
that is outside of earth, that is outside of creation, that is outside of space, time, and matter. Because we're not just matter in motion, but rather we're creations by God who can signify and decide what is good and what is evil, right? And that's the problem of evil. That's the problem. So evil actually acknowledges a higher power, a higher creator. So as we continue forward, I don't have that much left, I promise. And hopefully it's making sense. But I want to talk about one more thing, because that's kind of like uh, the theological answer, why God didn't get rid of things in, in the very beginning, why he didn't make evil, because he loves us, he gave us a choice, uh, how evil actually shows that there is a creator, a higher moral order. But now we're going to talk about the thing that I said earlier, because this is a question, why does God allow good and e or evil in this world? It's something that we feel, right? It's something that we've all had pain towards. Because the thing is, there's emotional pain as a result of evil and suffering in this world. There is. I don't, I'm not saying all of this. Like, my hope is that you don't take this and somebody is in their pain, in, in their uh, weeping, or in their downtrodden place, and you just say, like, well, guess what? Here's the truth. You know? That's, that's not my hope for this. If we look at the life of Jesus, he had some friends named Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Jesus was walking along the road, and he heard that his buddy Lazarus had died. And he was like, man, we need to go to Judea. We need to go over there and see him. And so when he gets into the town, um, Martha comes out and he gives her a theological answer. She, he, he, she first asks Jesus, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. And he says, I tell you, he will rise again. It's like, do you get what I'm saying? And she's like, yes, I, I get it. In the last days, he will rise again. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will rise again. He gives her the, the logical answer, right? The theological answer, and it's like, okay. But when he gets to Mary, when Mary comes out, she says the same thing. It says, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And she's in pain, and she's weeping. And so what Jesus does, he doesn't say the same thing. He doesn't say, oh, well, on the way, the truth and the life, and whoever believes in me will be resurrected again. But instead, he gives us the shortest verse in the Bible, and says, Jesus wept. Because in that moment, he understood she didn't need to hear the, the logical, truthful, like, here's what you need to hear. She just needed to be sat with. She needed to be cared for. She needed to be uh, comforted. And Jesus sympathizes with her. He cares about her. He met her in her emotional state. And so my hope is this, with this whole series, is, is not that we just slap people over the head with truth, but sympathize with them. And from person to person, it's different. With some people, we just have the straightforward conversation. With other people who are in pain and actual emotional distress, we need to sit with them and sympathize with them and be with them and point them in the right direction, just little nudges here and there. But the thing with this is how do I reconcile my emotional pain or others' emotional pain and suffering with the existence of an all-loving and all-powerful God, right? Because evil and suffering at times seem so pointless. But the thing with that is if we are part of this idea, just matter and motion, then evil and suffering is pointless. It has no point at all. It's valueless. It means nothing. But, there is, but if there is a God, he can turn that pain. He can turn that suffering. He can turn those things into an eternal good and possibly a good here in this life. Right? And so the thing is, God uh, doesn't abandon us, but rather he comforts us and he comes alongside us. In atheism, the, the idea that there is no God, that it's just all matter in motion, it gets rid of, it tries its best to get rid of God. And it, I think it does a poor job, honestly. But it never gets rid of pain. It has nothing, it can't say anything about pain, about suffering, about emotional well being. It can't say anything about that. It doesn't give us hope. As a matter of fact, getting rid of God just abandons hope completely. And so when we think about pain and suffering, and Jeremy, you could come on up. But when we think about pain and suffering, in my life, I'm going to give an example because I like being open. I like being honest. I like doing those things. And when we are stepping into people's emotional pain and dealing with our own. But I want to start by saying uh, my family is not the sanest bunch out there, okay? We're actually pretty crazy. And many of you guys know me, you know, deeper into my family, upbringing, all that. And I'm not saying it was just the worst, but we're definitely not the sanest. I, I kid you not. And the thing is, we're not the closest-knit family out there by any means, okay? I know myself personally, it's like when I go to give my father a hug, it's like, 
good, good to see you, <laughs> you know? Or even when I give my brother a hug, it's like, it feels awkward for me. My brother's super lovey-dovey now out of nowhere, but for me, I'm just like, love you, dude, you know? And my sister, I like barely started hugging my sister like a year ago. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, it's weird, okay? We're not the tightest knit family. And that comes from us growing up not that way, right? We didn't have like the family dinners. We didn't have, and this isn't a woe is me. I promise you, this is not, but I'm just giving you a little insight into my family. We didn't have family dinners. It was just like, do whatever you need to do. And there wasn't like family gathering and activities. We just didn't do those things. It's not what it is. It's like everybody does their own thing. It's like, cool. And so the thing with that, it's like we're not the tight, the closest knit family. <clears throat> and last year, yeah, in 2021, uh, we got COVID. I'm not here to talk about the ins and outs of COVID, but I remember my mom got it. And one morning we woke up and I went to her and she wasn't making any sense, right? She was just saying things I'm like, what's going on here? Like, there's something wrong, you know? And I took her temperature, it was like 105 degree temperature. So I'm like, okay. This is what's wrong. And I was, I was like sitting in front of her. I was like, Mom, do you know who I am? She was just like, huh? No. And I was like, okay, there's something very wrong here. She's speaking gibberish. There's something. And I was like worried because I hear horror stories like, oh, my gosh, like maybe something happened with her brain. Like her fever was so high she's going to have brain damage or whatever. And so my pops and I like lift her up on both sides. And she takes about three steps and just collapses. Just straight up collapses. We, we, held, we didn't let her fall to the ground, but she's just done. Her body's done. And so what happened, ended up happening is I had to grab her, just front ways, and I grabbed her, and I picked her up, and I just took her to the car and put her in the seat. And it was a scary moment. It's a terrifying moment, right? You're just like, oh, my gosh, is this really happening? And then I drove my parents to the hospital, and they admitted her pretty fast, which is good. But then those first couple days, it was like, especially with news and media and everything just flooding. Like, you, nobody knows what to think about anything, right? Everybody has an opinion. It's like there's 40 billion opinions. It's like, which one do I believe? <laughs> like, what's going on? And especially when something like this happens, it's like, well, I need to figure out what's the truth about this, right? And so I'm just seeing all the negative, like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen to her? Like, are they going to put on her ventilator? Like, her oxygen is obviously so depleted. I don't know what's going to happen. And it's scary, right? It was really terrifying in this moment, and I suppressed that, right? Because that's, there, there's my emotional upbringing right there. Um, <laughs> but I suppressed all that, and I was just like, oh, yeah, she's good. Like, it is, there's a few times where I'd be a little rough, and I'd, like, get a little tearful, right? But suppress that. And, and, and the thing in those moments is that I still had hope, though, you know? The thing with pain, it was a very painful moment for, and I, and for my mom, for my pops. And you asked the question, and I remember saying, like, because I was the first one to get it. And I was like, dude, this is my fault. Like, God, why couldn't you make this happen to me? Why didn't you do this to me? Like, why my mom? She's so caring, loving. Like, everybody, she's too fragile. Why would you do this, you know? All these things are popping through my head. All these things are going on in my head. And even like, uh, like Charlie Headley, and I got his permission to, to say all this, but he's in the middle of something right now, too. His father just passed away. He's 27 years old. His father passed away uh, pretty overnight. And it's sad. And in these moments, there's pain and there's suffering. And there's a lot of like, why, God? What's going on? Why could you do that? Why would you do that, God? Why would you take this person away? Or why would you do this? And I know in my life, and Chuck would say the same thing in his life, but in my story, in my mom's story, immediately, immediately, I saw how much people cared about my family. Immediately, I saw how much people cared about my father. Wanted to make sure he was taken care of. Wanted to make sure the rest of our family was taken care of, was checking up on things was going, and immediately our not-so-close-knit family got a little bit tighter. We didn't take leaps by any, by any means, but we took a little step. We took a little step, and so when we see these things and we see awfulness going on around us, this is how God works when there's pain, when there's suffering, when there's adversity. He works things together to ensure a greater good. To show us that our pain and our suffering is not pointless, it's not valueless, but it actually leads way to a greater good. And I think in that moment, my pops would never say this, but I think he needed to realize how much people cared about him. 
because he, it was in the middle of a pandemic. He watched his church go from like 1,300 people to like 500 people, and he's like, what's going on? And I think he would never admit this, but I think he needed a little bit. I think he needed God to show him like, hey, people care about you. Like what you're doing is not pointless, right? I think all of us needed a little bit, and right? Our, and our family got a little bit tighter. And you want to know the first things my mom said when she got out? She eventually got out. This is crazy. She said, I hope this moment teaches my, specifically my kids to be closer. It's like, that's the thing that you're thinking about while you're just like all tubed up, like, I don't know what's going on. She was miserable in there, absolutely miserable. And it's been a long time to get back. But that's the first thing that she said. It's almost like her pain and suffering, she knew God's going to do something with it. And I remember being so astounded, so like, you, what? She's like, I was praying for that every day that we'd get closer, that my kids would be closer. It was like, hold on here, mom. <laughs> what? Because the thing is, with God, with the Lord, pain and suffering isn't pointless. Because we look at Romans 8.28, and here's the beautiful thing. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say when your job's going good. It doesn't say when your marriage is going good. It doesn't say uh, when life is good, when the family's all knit together, all, everything's fine. It says he causes all things to work together for good. He causes the broken relationships. He causes the family strife. He causes not getting the job. He causes broken uh, family relationships. He causes terrible things, the divorces, the, the anger, the, the, the pain, the suffering, the strife, everything. He causes all things. I think easily God could have said, you know what, uh, just some things. But he's specific in writing through Paul in Romans, and he says, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Guess what? We're all called should we choose to put our belief in Jesus Christ, okay? The moment you say, Jesus, you are Lord, you're called. You're called. Because that's who the Lord is. He causes all things to work together for good. So why not choose him? And tell your friends and tell them, hey, this is why I believe in God. This is why I trust in him. And this is why I put my faith in him because I know that he's causing all things to work together for my good. I think if you talk to anybody who's past the age of 20, they're knuckleheads. I'm a knucklehead too. But I think if you ask anybody what they're, when they learn their greatest life lessons and when they grew the most, they'll say in pain, in adversity, in suffering, in my family splitting apart, in my relationships splitting apart, in the loss of somebody, in the job not working out, and feeling rejection, that's when I grew the most. I think anybody who's honest would admit the same thing, that it's only through adversity. It's only through these moments. So we know that when we see pain and we say suffering, it's so weird, but we have such a joy or we could have such a joy that it's like you see this happening and it's not in a cynical way and it's not in a like, I'm not identifying and understanding what's the, the weight of what's happening, but it's like, God, what are you doing? What are you up to? I can't wait to see the fruit that comes from this pain, that comes from this suffering, because this pain and suffering isn't pointless. It's not valueless, and it's not for no reason, but rather it's to bring about a greater good. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, like I said, God could have just wiped them out or started us, but he's like, you know what? In spite of the evil, in spite of the pain, in spite of you doing wrong, I'm gonna choose the greater good, and God chose the greater good, which is a loving relationship with each and every one of us through Jesus Christ. And the thing about Jesus, if you think about him, he entered, he entered into the pain and suffering of our lives, of human beings. What other God leaves their throne to dwell among their creation? And he entered into pain, into suffering, into anxiety, into brokenness, into broken families into a, a people group who was oppressing Jews, oppressing everybody, basically who didn't have some cash on them, you know? And he entered into this pain, and guess what? It's through his pain and suffering that also brought about an even greater good that allows us to have relationship with him. And so we see the story, the, the, the overarching story of Jesus, whom the word writes about completely, that it's through pain and suffering that God brings about his greater good each 
and every time. Each and every time. And it was through physical death that God brought about the greatest good, right? It was through death that God defeated death. (laughs) That's weird. (laughs) And it's through that that he gives us the ultimate hope that we get to have a life that's eternal, that we get to have a life that dwells with God, that we get to have a life that dwells um, with, with him for eternity. So pain and suffering and evil, it's rough, it's tough. I get it. I think everybody in this room gets it. We've all been through it. But the thing about God is that he works things together for the good who are called to his purpose, right? There's nothing lost with God. There's nothing lost in his hand. There's nothing lost in his sovereign hand. No matter how far you've gone, no matter how far you think you are, God still has you right there. God still has you there. And that's what we put our hope in. Because atheism leaves us in pain, but God gives us hope. And that's just the way that it is. So I hope and pray that today, this not only maybe caused a movement in your heart, but also for the Christian, you would use this understanding to be bold with your faith, to be ready, to seek out conversations. Remember, not to slap people in the face, but to tell people how much God loves them, tell them how much God cares for them, to tell them, man, God has such an amazing plan for you. Just turn to him. Repent and turn to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.